uh, I don't have. Uh, 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 is a formal presentation because I was informed by Umar Ghani this afternoon uh, while I was traveling to Gilgit. Uh, but certainly, I would just like to highlight uh, the objective of the uh, Grand Challenge Fund, our Global Challenge Fund, and uh, how does it uh, differ from other kinds of uh, proposals which we normally uh, think in the uh, research grants. Uh, so uh, as given in the uh, preamble of this GCF, we see that the objective is to bring collaboration between the leading research institutions, which have been already uh, given in the website, the website of HEC, and then connecting them uh, with the other institutions and partners from private uh, and public sector universities in abroad. Uh, so one of the objectives, which is very uh, imminent here, is to create uh, the transfer of uh, expertise from the senior uh, institutions, which are already very well in terms of the research productivity, and at the same time, uh, then bringing the expertise from uh, different international universities in thematic areas, which are globally uh, uh, challenged at the moment, uh, which constitute a grand challenge for the entire academia around the world. And at the same time, uh, this proposal also uh, highlights that we may bring the private uh, sector partners with us from the industry so that the trickle down effect of this uh, research is going down to the societies at large. Uh, what in fact have been identified is the core areas in this uh, call for the Grand Challenge Fund. Uh, for example, uh, one of the biggest problem we face is the food security. And uh, when we look at uh, the Gilgit Baltistan scenario, what we find is that uh, with the climate change uh, and with the change in the pattern of weathers uh, and extended monsoon now, uh, we are witnessing a lot of changes in the weather patterns, and that is really creating a very big threat to the very small uh, food basket of the region. Uh, Dr. how much time do I have? Um, about uh, half an hour, sir, if you have to. Okay. Uh, you can so I'll, I'll just that. talk for, yes, for five, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we can uh, ask questions. Uh, so uh, when we talk now the food security issue, which we have witnessed, uh, we did uh, some research also in that, and we could find that the areas uh, which uh, were were having very uh, good kind of uh, climate for the growing of potatoes and different products, uh, different commodities in the Gilgit Baltistan are becoming hotter now, and the yield of the uh, the, these crops is going down. At the same time, in some of areas uh, uh, like sugar and other parts of the, uh, uh, the Skardu region, we could see, uh, Baltistan region, we could see that the increase in temperature is creating a bit conducive environment for the uh, growing of different crops. So certainly the food security by and large is becoming one of the grand and global challenge for the Pakistan in all parts of the country, and when we talk about uh, Gilgit Baltistan, it's certainly a very big challenge. The second area uh, uh, is the sustainable energy, and I was just thinking about uh, uh, the various options we can uh, develop. For example, the more important is that how the re renewable technologies around the countries can uh, uh, become uh, some of the opportunities like the solar, thermal, uh, PV, and then we can how the hydroelectric uh, generation uh, again is very big area, and uh, in within this we can try to see that how the uh, modular design of the various turbines can be experimented in different parts of the country to see that how can we develop the standalone turbine problem. So this again a very a grand challenge for the entire world in Pakistan that how can we bring the uh, highly uh, uh, cheap and durable clean energy, uh, which does not bring a lot of uh, pollutant load and the uh, greenhouse gases load to the environment. 
Now, within that, uh, the second important thing is then to increase the efficiency of the systems. And uh, this is, again, very important area uh, in which we can think of the smart grid technologies and the, uh, uh, the smart metering technologies. Uh, I'm just exploring the ideas which we can take up in the grand challenge for the young, for the young uh, researchers, but for the budding researchers. Uh, and how then we can improve the efficiency of the systems of appliances. Uh, for example, this morning I was discussing with one, my, one, one of my juniors researcher in NUST, uh, Dr. Azhar Gul, who is doing a uh, very good work with me on the uh, small hydro zero, zero head uh, turbine system. And we got a funding from the Pakistan Science Foundation. Uh, and we are trying to see that how can we develop with the support of NUST uh, standalone zero head turbine systems. So this ca that can be an idea that how we can bring the efficient turbine design and manufacturing. Uh, the third and the very important aspect that can be that we develop some turbine manufacturing facility uh, in different parts of the country where we have the open flow uh, available. And uh, I'm just looking forward to see that if we can develop some uh, manufacturing facility at the Karakoram uh, center of renewable energy and appropriate technology. Uh, so, and the third and the most important part of this challenge can be that how we can mobilize the societies and we can mobilize the consumers and the users about the energy conservation techniques, the uh, the passive building design techniques in which we are rely uh, heavily on the natural uh, heating and cooling and ventilation systems so that can be again a very big uh, a very big opportunity another uh, very important uh, area is the water management and water conservation again and uh, for example one of the biggest challenge in in the country is the depleting depleting water resources per capita at the same time the wastage of water so how can we develop uh, community based systems uh, in which we can bring a uh, 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 the involvement of the people. Uh, let me tell you that we are currently doing a project with the British Academy and the Aga Khan University is a partner in this uh, uh, London office is partner with us and Aka. And we are working to see that how the uh, community-based uh, water supply system had been very successful under the WASIP uh, water and sanitation uh, program of the Aka, and how can we replicate this model in the, uh, in, in the urban setting to bring the community-based water supply system. So this can uh, be another very big challenge, and uh, we can address th through different design, and then again, again the conservation of water uh, can be a very important uh, area where we can work with uh, different type of faucets. We can think about uh, bringing some technologies, sensor technologies, uh, which can be developed indigenously with uh, cheaper uh, technologies and cheaper materials so that it can be uh, widely used around the world, uh, around the country. Uh, one of the biggest challenge uh, which has been highlighted in this Grand Challenge Fund is the climate adaptation. Uh, we're working with the uh, couple of uh, uh, UNDP and we are working with the AC mode and again with the WWF. And let me tell you that this is really becoming a major disaster in the north of Pakistan. We experienced uh, two glass events this year, one in Shishpur and other in Batswat, uh, which has led to a lot of uh, destruction of the livelihood and land of the area. So how can we uh, uh, mitigate the impact of the climate change and how can we adapt to that in terms of capacity building, in, in terms of vulnerability assessment of the communities. And in, so that can be another big, very big challenge in which the, uh, the researcher in Pakistan can work uh, with the leading researcher, research institutions of the world. And the, uh, the disaster uh, forecasting is another area within the climate change, which can be again, uh, uh, thought to be a grave challenge for the entire nation. And uh, we can have the different scenario analysis uh, based on which we can think about the uh, mitigation measures. So this is uh, another uh, climate adaptation or climate uh, change and adaptation is another very big challenge we can handle and we can work up uh, framing our uh, research uh, question around this. The disaster management, we tried to pitch uh, one of our projects uh, last year, uh, but it couldn't uh, hunt the funding. But uh, certainly the disaster management, again, is very important area. 
and Pakistan is experiencing a, a multitude of disasters, uh, starting from earthquakes. Uh, then you have the glove events, the flood, the river run floods, the flash floods. You could see in, even in Islamabad last month, we in the monsoon we can see we could see in the E level some of the disastrous kind of floods. So this is again uh, the disaster management uh, can be a very uh, big uh, project uh, which is becoming really a, a global challenge and a great challenge for the entire humanity. That how can we move out of this? Uh, uh, disasters to better planning and better design of the structures and systems. Uh, so that is another uh, very important area uh, where the young uh, researchers can uh, play their role. I was just browsing uh, some of the, uh, the literature this morning to see that how the engineering applications to in the Global uh, Challenge Fund or Great Challenge Fund can be pitched. For example, the solar energy uh, is becoming really a very uh, important area of research in which we uh, would like to bring efficient design systems uh, and efficient uh, deployment system in, in which, for example, uh, how can we improve the uh, efficiencies of the uh, solar system, which is typically not more than 10 to uh, 15 or 20 percent maximum at the moment when we talk about the PV systems. Uh, so this is really a very big area in which we need to work on a global uh, are a grand challenge uh, in which we would try to bring some kind of technologies uh, in which we can manufacture some of the solar PV cells in Pakistan. And again, we can bring some technologies to improve their efficiency. Uh, within the uh, uh, parameter of the solar energy, uh, another is uh, important is to make it more economical. And certainly that would come from the fact that once we have a PV cell, is uh, most affordable, then we can think about the, uh, the uh, PV technology of the solar system. Another area of the solar system or solar energy uh, can be the solar heating system, which has been very much neglected even Uh, more recently, but historically it has been used for the heating and cooling, at least for the heating of the premises uh, in the summer and the winters. So I think the, uh, the, uh, this is again very important that we, uh, uh, we talk about, we think about the Okay, now, sir, okay, I'm, am I audible? Uh, yes, uh, we lost you for a there bit. Was, yes, you, uh... yes yeah. there was some distortion in the internet. It's uh, sitting even in Islamabad, you experience this kind of issue, but you, you may then think of what we have. Uh... No, okay, so please, I uh, think carry on. We can hear you. Your okay, audience. sir. So uh, within the solar, I was discussing that how can we improve in the storage capacity of the uh, solar system? Because again, it is relying on the uh, battery systems and the battery efficiency again is not very high. Uh, even we talk about the lithium batteries, the life is not more than five or six years. And this brings a lot of, uh, uh, so how can we think about the on grid systems, uh, which can be towed to the uh, grid online and that can produce uh, certainly uh, less uh, cost for the, but at the same time, uh, when, the, when we talk about the off-grids, then we uh, need the storage uh, capacity and to improve the storage capacity of the various battery systems. And again, a very uh, challenging area, which can be taken collectively by some of the emerging universities and, uh, and following universities like us. Uh, then we can talk about the, uh, the uh, improvement of urban infrastructure in which the transportation uh, the uh, infrastructure, urban planning, and again, the urban planning is one of the area which has been highlighted in the Grand Challenge Fund. Uh, and again, if we talk about the uh, north of Pakistan, uh, let me uh, explain that uh, it is a disaster being done in terms of planning, uh, because the land use plan has been highly unsustainable in the last uh, three to four decades. So the most important is that how can we develop a holistic system of urban planning uh, which is having a zonation and policy and institutional framework to guide the governments uh, around the country 
uh, to have a better and sustainable urban planning. Uh, within urban planning, then we can talk about the transportation and green transportation system, and uh, then uh, electrical vehicles uh, transportation system. And you might have seen in Europe, uh, they, uh, they have committed to become totally green energy transportation system by 2030. And you will see at, at, at all the malls and all the uh, airports, you would see that the plugs have been given for the recharging of the electrical vehicles. So this is really becoming a new challenge uh, that how can Pakistani uh, researchers uh, work together for electrical vehicles for a vehicles which can be, uh, or at least for the battery part of the vehicles, which can uh, be more durable and uh, more uh, sustainable and uh, cost effective. Uh, then uh, at the same time, the water conservation in the cities is another challenge. Uh, how can, for example, we develop the systems which can improve the recharge capacity? Even in, uh, in Islamabad, I would love to see some of the universities who can uh, develop some mechanism for the water recharge gear release and kind of retention dams de designs, which can uh, retain a lot of uh, precipitation and rainfall and runoff, which is going down to the rivers is wasted. And we have a lot of high drought in the, in the city. Uh, you might have experienced that we have a high floods in the, uh, in, the, in the monsoon, but at the same time, we have the drought in the uh, summer and the water level goes down much below and it's really very difficult to extract this uh, water. So how can we uh, improve the water recharge capacity through construction of different uh, water recharge galleries across the uh, city and how can the universities which are placed in Islamabad can help the other universities to design such system which can uh, reuse the rainwater uh, which is being harvested. So that can be another idea to design the system uh, for the rain har water harvesting in the different premises, in the uh, highways. And uh, in, I was really very really pleased to see in some of the uh, townships when, where I visited that they, I visited one of the townships last evening and I was uh, really happy. It was heavily raining and I was there and I could see that they had some, uh, some reservoirs have been constructed in which the water coming from the different drainage system have been deposited. Uh, which is uh, at one hand used for the articulture, and at the same time it is used for the water recharge of the adjoining area. So how can we think about a global problem or a grand problem which is faced by the country uh, in terms of water shortage and how this water which is uh, uh, surface runoff uh, can be collected through different system of rain har water harvesting and that can be used to recharge the water and even that water which is stored uh, can be reused for the uh, cleaning and gardening and horticulture. So that is another very interesting area in which I think the uh, grand challenge uh, researchers can work and they can uh, think about the uh, uh, pandemic uh, and the frequency of pandemics again is very important. And uh, I was just uh, looking at the, uh, the five or six major uh, priorities of the UN. And one of the uh, is to have a, uh, a, a one health uh, or a secure health for the entire, with, when we talk about the sustainable development goals. And this, this decade of 2020 to 2030 is the last decade in which we have to fulfill the require the 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 uh, the, uh, fifth, the 17 sustainable development goals so again uh, within those goals uh, we normally uh, talk about local challenge fund but the broader uh, uh, challenges which are global also are grand uh, challenge also include the climate the water the energy and things like that so uh, then uh, uh, lastly uh, in the grand challenge, we would like to bring uh, some ideas and some things like how to improve the inclusion uh, and uh, uh, mitigate the exclusions uh, of different kinds of uh, so inequality, reducing inequalities in society. How can we empower the youth and particularly the female, the people with disabilities, the people like transgenders are also very important now. 
there is legislation for them. So I think this can also be a very big uh, grand challenge, uh, uh, which we can take up that how can we uh, remove the inequalities in society by empowering the different segments of society, particularly the youth and the people of uh, uh, remote areas, the people of underprivileged areas, and then the people with disability and uh, special abilities rather, and uh, the people uh, with transgenders, uh, can, uh, how can we develop uh, some kind of mechanism and policies for them. So I think, uh, Dr. Saab, uh, this was just a holistic idea uh, that what can be the various areas for the great challenge uh, uh, fund and how uh, later on we can discuss further about the collaborations and things like that. Thank you very much. I think the next speaker are uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for your insightful information. Um, we have, uh, I think we have Dr. Mazhar Iqbal here with us. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Mazhar Iqbal, are you with us in the chat, sir? If you would like to uh, start yeah. your presentation. Yes, please. Okay. Well, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, um, I mean, apologies, uh, let me introduce you first, sir, and uh, maybe you can start off with your presentation, Jim. Um, Dr. Mazhar Iqbal is the Deputy Chief Scientist and Head of uh, Health Biotechnology Division, uh, National Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering. Um, uh, sir, uh, the floor is yours now, Jim. So, uh, can you hear me, please? Hello. Yes, sir. You are you are uh, audible. Sir. Yes, sir. And uh, is the, this you know uh, slides are appeared right on the screen of your computer? Uh, yes, the slides yes. are fine. That's okay. Okay, so I will be just uh, scrolling through uh, uh, the few slides I have really prepared quickly. Uh, and uh, uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, HC for uh, inviting me and giving the, me an opportunity to, to give a small, uh, concise uh, presentation on framing a such project to address grand and local challenges. Uh, uh, Professor Atawla Shah has already uh, described uh, uh, quite detailed, uh, especially related to the themes of the GCF project. I will be just starting with uh, this hadith that talabu lilmu fizatun ala kulle musliman wa musliman ilm ka hasil karna har musliman par farz hai kis kism ka ilm whatever we are going to do just learn about it before yani jo bhi aap karna ja rahe hain usse pehle kuch ke bare mein seekh le that is kind of uh, ilm what I, ever i have you know imagined and second of these subjects is Nielma. So, so this means that even if you are, we are going to submit a grant proposal, we need to learn first uh, about that funding opportunity, what sort of this is, what are the limitations, what is the opportunity, what is the scope, and what are the themes. So. Uh, the first step is actually uh, whenever any funding agency actually announce the grant proposal, the best thing is just uh, sit down and detail the guidelines and their noting. First, you know, before making any, uh, we have a habit that we we actually learn a lot of information from other colleagues and then we start writing proposal rather than just sitting and uh, reading in detail about the funding agency, their guideline, their, uh, I mean, uh, coming toward this, you know, uh, uh, next slide, that is a grand challenge and local challenge funding opportunities. The grand challenge is a bigger, a much bigger funding opportunity as compared to local challenge, but the both are like the highest uh, funding opportunities or the biggest funding opportunities uh, currently HCC has in, uh, research and development programs. Uh, I think uh, Daksab has already discussed quite a lot about uh, uh, the uh, 
the theme or the, uh, the different information related to grand challenge. Now, I'll just be going quickly through that the GCF is basically mean uh, for promotion of strategic research excellence, which involve innovation, new knowledge development, but a significant aspect uh, includes economic development. So there are two basically a major aspect of this GCF uh, funding scheme, innovation and innovation-based economic development. Uh, these proposals involve large, multi-sectorial, multi-dimensional uh, opportunity. And uh, this proposal also uh, required to have uh, a strong collaborative approach, a broad-based thematic research, and ultimately the goal is the capacity development and social impact, uh, mainly economic development. So these are, uh, you know, thematic priority areas uh, Daksab has already discussed in detail. Uh, I'm not going to touch these. Uh, again, you know, uh, uh, the last one is the health and well-being. And uh, the local challenge fund is basically addressing the local research issues. Uh, it has a very strong aspect of uh, local community involvement, like society, governmental institutions, industry, and uh, it should uh, uh, cover the needs of the local community. Uh, uh, the project should uh, has capability for the development of local research capacity, strengthening of research of host institution is also another aspect of uh, local challenge fund. So these are the local challenge fund uh, thematic uh, priority areas, arts and humanities, social behavior and economic sciences, agriculture uh, sciences, biological and health sciences, engineering and technology, mathematics and physical sciences. Yes. So I will be talking a little bit more about, you know, uh, uh, some some of the information which uh, Daksab has not covered, actually. Uh, the step one is actually whenever we, we are entering into a competition, it's not uh, about how well known we are or our organization is. The most important is a document which we are submitting. I mean, the proposal which is going to the HCC that uh, I know a lot of uh, uh, highly respected and highly efficient uh, colleagues who have a uh, very, very strong uh, CVs and they are very well known and their proposal has been rejected because the proposal was not up to the mark. I mean, it's not the, it, it's, it's not the person which is important. It is the document uh, which we are going to submit uh, to HEC uh, is the most important. So uh, the first is uh, we need to have a, a good attitude to develop uh, or to formulate or to establish or to edit a strong, a good proposal. Step two is uh, understand what the funder actually want to invest. Now, this is universal. It's not only uh, applicable to GCF, LCS, uh, but it is uh, uh, more or less universal to all funding opportunities, you know, including like HEC, NRPU program, uh, TDF. Every specific funding agency has a specific themes. And on the basis of themes, we have to submit the proposal uh, to cover these themes. Uh, step three actually is meet the need of the funder. Again, you know, uh, uh, drafting a good quality proposal start from rationality. What has already been done? A very, very important uh, aspect is including our own work. Where is the gap? How our effort will fill these gaps? 
and how we will fill that gap, give a detailed execution plan, and what are our capabilities. These are actually uh, more or less six points which, uh, which are required to be addressed by almost every proposal, including uh, GCF, and TDF, uh, sorry, GCF and LCF. Uh, step four is plan your budget like an accountant. Fill the budget section wisely. I on total budget. And balance in various sections, proper calculation and strong justification. So GCF and LCF, uh, whenever we are going to, so when we should start actually uh, uh, the filling of the document or to initiate uh, this uh, grant submission, actually we need to plan in very well advance before the announcement because our, these are com complex, complicated grant opportunities. So we need to complete the homework before their announcement. Generally, it required around a uh, few years, I would say, uh, the, the homework, the basic work which uh, uh, the PI or the team should have to complete before you know, uh, starting uh, GCF and LCF level proposals. Define the concept and the title. Uh, it is extremely important uh, if we have some pre preliminary data on which we are submitting this proposal. Avoid jumping out of blue. I mean, the, on the work which we have already not done anything, and we are going to write GCF and LCF proposal. Even currently, it is very difficult to win an RPU proposal if we have not done uh, anything related search work on it. So when to start again, you know, fill out the budget part, calculation, justifications. I would say before the announcement of that proposals, manage the quotation, complete the methodology section, because these are the things which can be done easily before. Update your CV. Uh, Arrange co-PI collaborator, define their roles. Complete most of the spade work before, again, because whenever GCF and LCF uh, grant proposals are announced, there are around 30 to 40 days in which, in this time to know, we have to submit uh, these uh, big grant proposals. So we have to start uh, the spade work before the announcement of these proposals. Have discussion with seasoned colleagues. Uh, just to uh, comment on a little bit on proposal structure, title, uh, very, very important. Just if kind of first introduction of your proposal to the HCC and to the reviewer. Uh, but, better to have a running title Budget, extremely uh, critical decision, I would say. Wisely decided. Putting more burden on the rope is likely to break that rope. So keep, uh, keep eye on, on, on the total budget. It is extremely important uh, that uh, the budget, uh, uh, according to my experience, uh, uh, the grant proposals around 30% of my grant proposal dropped, they have a budget related issue. If I have put a little bit less budget, it was likely that they may touch the, that you know, winning line. So uh, my suggestion and request is that, uh, 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 that wisely decide about your budget, uh, about, the project, about the project digest and summary. This is the second, uh, I would say the most important aspect of the pr proposal. This is pitch of the proposal. Almost 50% of the decision making uh, are going to be done on, on your project summary and digest because uh, uh, you have to actually play with this psychology of the reviewers. 
uh, whenever the reviewers so read your project digester summary, uh, it generally it have at the end of uh, that summary it generally uh, reviewers has an idea either to uh, to grant or recommend this proposal or not. So it is extremely extremely important. Be concise, very relevant, and well structured. A good flow. Avoid too many abbreviation. Keep in mind that the reviewer must not repeat the reading of any lines of your project digest. It have a very, very good flow. Use relatively simple words. Avoid even your no extensive English wording. Do not, uh, I mean, we have to keep very easy and happy reviewers and try to sell your scientific concept rather than anything else. I may uh, point uh, uh, as an example about my uh, three best proposal I have submitted. Uh, these are, uh, the first one was ICGB. Uh, uh, in 2013, we have been able to win that grant. Initially, we submitted that proposal. It was rejected. The main thing when we analyze, we have added more words than required. And the, finally, if I share uh, that proposal, which we actually, we have been able to one, is just a start from here, title, summary, a brief work plan, and then, you know, references. Uh, just timeline, budget, it's just eight page proposal. And before this, we have like maybe 15 page proposal in previous year when we submitted. So uh, uh, we need to be very concise. Whatever uh, we have learned actually after the rejection of that proposal that what went wrong. That was we, we asked more money, we put more work. And we have uh, uh, written uh, too much, too many words. And this is a typical example of inexperienced PI. So uh, I would say, sorry, just a minute. Sorry, I just have to step back. <laughs> so, so the, our second uh, proposal was, uh, uh, the proposal which uh, I submitted uh, was HCTDF grant process development of for industry skill cleaning of aflatoxin from rice through ultraviolet radiation. Again, I want to share a summary. Rationality, few lines, a very clear work done already, what we have already done, where we are, <clears throat> what we intend to do. Clear and concise. And in this, because we have industry collaborator, uh, which actually uh, 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 has uh, commented to give uh, more than 50% of the uh, money in this project. Uh, so this project also was uh, run. And third project is, uh, which we recently won from PSF, uh, 400 projects were submitted and four were only awarded. Again, in this project, uh, we have uh, uh, learned the lessons that we need to be very appropriate, very concise. <clears throat> so 
sorry. So uh, going towards goal and objective, uh, such as my hypothesis followed by concise objective with clear tangible economic impact. Industry, identify end user beneficiary industry well in advance. And involvement of end user industry, government institutions, keep in mind where uh, you will be in third, fourth, and fifth year at the start of the project. GCF and LCF project has a huge, you know, follow-up aspect. So what will be done, what will be uh, uh, happen after the completion of this GCF or LCF project? This is one of the ex extremely important aspect of uh, these grant proposals. Again, uh, going towards introduction, well-structured rationality, gap identification, possible solution, supported by literature, Justification for the research problem, research methodology, Gantt chart is extremely, extremely important because that is the actually uh, the thing which a uh, reviewer has to follow, even in progress reports. Work done by PI already need to be mentioned somewhere in it because uh, we have to, uh, you have to be uh, uh, prove or show that you are capable to perform all the steps which uh, you have mentioned. Detail execution plan, methodology, generally new PIE usually struggle here. They do not give you know, detail execution plan. This, they put a lot of uh, write up in, in a, at the start in the summary. And uh, uh, the summary has a lot of irrelevant uh, uh, words, but whenever they, they reach to the methodology, they, they, they do not put adequate or enough information. And where you are going to give data, uh, make sure all of the references are given, relevant, but not very old. Own references can have a good impact. Uh, going towards the impact, uh, we need to uh, clearly uh, elaborate the real impact. Please note less English, more math, calculation less words, more kind of calculated impact. Avoid unnecessary and verbose claims and link your every proposal actually required a linkage with sustainable development goals, including GCF and LCF. Collaborate, identify collaborating organization, collaboration add up the way to the project and necessary for GCF and LCF proposals. Uh, when we are talking about PI, uh, please provide complete and precise detail of required information. Because currently, HEC has reduced the size of the CV. It's like more or less around two pages. So keep only very relevant information. Uh, unnecessary information may be avoided because ultimately it is the reviewer which has to spend a lot of time. Uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, we do not waste the reviewer time. Do not deny him or her. We need to be very, very friendly. So avoid unnecessary and verbose claims. Identify, you need to have a very good copy I, national and international collaborator, not as a filler, but relevant and complementary. Having strong CV, uh, and networking are, are, are always uh, helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I have uh, just uh, uh, elaborated a few of the points which have, have uh, uh, not uh, you know, described by Professor Ataullah Shah Saab. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazak Balsab. Uh, this was a very uh, detailed and informative presentation. I hope uh, our participants that are future grant uh, uh, applicants, they uh, I hope they're taking notes because these were very valid and valuable points that they can use in their own research. Now, I think we have Dr. our third speaker, Dr. Ayaz, uh, Yasser Ayaz with us. Sir, are you here, sir? Dr. Yasser Ayaz, could you unmute yourself? I'm here. Uh, Dr. Yasser Ayaz, 
is the head of department to robotics and artificial intelligence at NUST University. Um, so the floor is yours uh, for uh, your presentation. Right, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me here and it's a great pleasure to speak to everyone. Let me start my video as well. So already two speakers have spoken in great detail about uh, the LCF and uh, I'm sure that a lot of the uh, researchers listening must also be developing a very good idea about what sort of proposals they have to be. So I will I, I didn't prepare a formal presentation or slides because I thought this was going to be a panel discussion format. But um, since I've gone through this experience several times and I can point out the relevant details from the GC's website as well. So I'll share that screen and I'll talk about some of the stuff from there and point out the relevant aspects. So you see that like uh, when it comes to identifying like um, any any time that we try to uh, formulate a proposal when we try to put uh, you know together a problem to work on uh, as researchers the first thing is what sort of uh, like uh, research subject to work on so it's it's a very like of course all of us are good researchers we all know that we have to be thorough in almost every aspect especially for a proposal like gcf or lcf we have to be thorough with every kind, every section in the proposal is important. And as uh, Dr. Dr. Bazar speaking before me has highlighted that, for example, if you include co-PIs, they have to be relevant people. If you have uh, like a, a, a certain, for example, industrial partner, so you should have like some sort of proof that like, you know, you have been collaborating with them, but it's a valid research problem. So every single point in this has to be very thorough and every single section has to be very thorough. You have to write the proposal very effectively. That is, of course, understood and we all know that. Now, when we start thinking of proposal, because today is like also one of the aspects to be discussed today is how to frame the problem in the right way for it to be considered as a, a local challenge fund problem, right? So for it to get funding from that, how to phrase the problem? How do we establish that this is a local challenge, right? So uh, already HEC has highlighted, and as it is there on the uh, like local challenge fund, uh, you could say the main page as well, it gives two links. One link is to this page that I've opened, that I've shared with you just now, and the other one is to the SDGs Pakistan. So we'll come to that as well. So as you see here, for example, there are several areas which HEC has highlighted as the research priority areas. So I'd say that when you prepare a proposal, when you start preparing a proposal, the first thing to do is to look at the priority areas already highlighted by HEC and to really go through the list one by one. Of course, as it says in the description of the local challenge fund, that this uh, basically is an applied research kind of uh, thematic area or uh, thematic, you could say, grant area in which like, they want you to actually like, uh, connect the socioeconomic uh, linkage of your research it, that has to be emphasized in the proposal document. And that has to actually come out as a result of your research as well. So in general, you can see that, for example, even if you are, for example, an engineer, many of the things you develop can have an application in, uh, for example, areas related to agriculture, for instance, or if you're a computer scientist, maybe a software you're developing may be useful for employment, you know, which is there for economic stability, economic or investment or export competitiveness, et cetera. So a lot of these things are overlapping and they're not related to just one field or one area. So the stronger network you develop, the more copies that you bring in and who are relevant people and the bigger institutions that you can actually bring in as partners, in my opinion, that really enhances your chances of uh, you know, getting the project. So I think the first point to start with when you come to uh, like preparing a proposal for getting grant is would be to really go through all these areas if you have uh, some partners that you regularly collaborate with and who are strong researchers, get their input as well and like really brainstorm on these uh, problems that HEC has already highlighted as the priority research areas. Now, the second thing is that there are a lot of them, right? And most of these are pretty general, like uh, they're not uh, like exactly one single problem that needs to be uh, handled. Like for example, battery and storage technologies. Now this is one whole theme within which there'll be many sub themes. Like for example, in sociology and philosophy, there'll be like identity politics, index, urban planning, et cetera. You can, I think uh, some of these areas were gone through by uh, Tawla Saab as well. I mean, he was talking about the important areas which you can cover. 
So uh, if you want a whole list, you can have a look at this page. So, and also like, uh, I will not go one by one, but maybe just take an example from some of them. Like for example, criminology can have a lot of technical aspects as well. It can have a lot of, uh, you could say social aspects as well. So it can, it can come from economics. It can come from computer science side. It can come from many different areas like harassment at work. For example, you could actually have a, a program related to artificial intelligence with which you could uh, detect if the harassment is taking place or not, or uh, to prevent harassment as well, like uh, also the design of buildings, which like uh, and placement of resources within the building, which actually uh, prevent you know uh, crimes or you know like uh, especially against genders and stuff like that. So you, a lot of these things can be done. Uh, like uh, uh, you would say, uh, sensors related to such things or building networks using clouds, etc., can be one example. So, uh, uh, but the purpose, of course, of uh, my talk right now is not to identify an exact uh, proposal subject on which you can work. And it wouldn't be useful because there are there are 118 people listening, and if everybody developed the same proposal, it would be uh, you know like uh, it would be like everybody is copying the same thing. But I am coming towards a very important point out of this whole thing, and that is that, for instance, if you are preparing a proposal and you are highlighting any one of these areas, for example, organizational management or international law or any area or crop management, whatever area you are highlighting from all of these areas, the first thing is to actually present your problem as if it is a very important, uh, you know, uh, local problem for Pakistan, right? You have to phrase how big an impact you know there is with uh, the, the current problem that is in place so describe the problem in relevant detail establish the problem as a critical problem within your uh, like you, you have to really really write it down that in which part of the thesis with which part of the, uh, it is the thesis in the beginning in which part of the proposal document you're going to actually establish that this problem is a critical problem to establish that as the local challenge that is number one right uh, how it impacts and how many things you know that there are the sustainable development goals let me show you a glimpse of that as well i have that website open too i can show you that one as well yeah so so for example in summary there are like these uh, this uh, this all this website also the link is there on hcc's website i just opened it from there and here's a very brief summary. You can read about all of them in, in detail, like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality. So how uh, when uh, the proposal that you're writing and the problem that you're trying to write within a certain problem, how many of these sustainable development goals your proposal actually impact? So I'd say uh, start from the idea there'll be several ideas that you can work on you and your colleagues if you have a group already made or if for example you're going to make the group in both cases so start with an idea uh, figure out how this is big how big a population this is impacting how it is critical for pakistan and jot down some of those things then you have to get material to actually beef up your proposal you have to get numbers and you have to go to uh, uh, organizations as well which can be part, potential partner industrial organizations if you have worked on this research you may already have some of uh, your linkages with some of these organizations uh, in advance and the second thing you can do is to create a matrix and you can actually try to relate the problem that uh, is there and its solution its possible solution that you're suggesting with the sustainable development goals and you could actually uh, try to rank the impact, try to link the impact of the problem that you're trying to solve with these sustainability development goals that how going to help us achieve these SDGs and how many SDGs out of the 17 does it link together with, right? So in this way, you can try to uh, like uh, put together a proposal and to frame it uh, as a uh, local challenge uh, proposal, first of all, as the problem itself. So once do you have established, so for the problem we came upon two things. One is that there are the research priority areas of HEC which are already shared on the website. So both of these links, let me also show you where you can find these links actually that will make your job further easier. So uh, here in the in the local challenge fund where you see the main page of HEC local challenge fund, these are, there are two links. Link number one is the HEC research priority list which I showed you uh, in the first place. So what you can do is that you can go to that list read through that list, identify a number of problems that you can work on, and then think about uh, every one of these problems and its impact on people. Because the, the key criteria mentioned in the uh, description of the uh, 
local talent fund everywhere is also socioeconomic impact, right? So uh, that's where you have to relate it with. And the second is how it relates with the SDG priority areas. So you have to map that with the SDG priority areas. Now to get the funding, this is simply this is not enough. Like this is one thing in which you establish that the problem you're working on is a big problem, right? It's 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 a problem worth working on. It's a problem that ATC or World Bank should fund, right? And it will uh, bring you know uh, a lot of improvement in different sectors in Pakistan, uh, improve Pakistan in terms of a lot of SDGs and uh, like uh, 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 help us grow socioeconomically. But at, that, at the same time, you have to establish that you are actually capable of solving this problem. So in that, uh, if you put a problem, for example, which is completely unrelated with whatever work you've done in the past, it won't really sit very well with uh, the judges, with the reviewers, because they have to also comment in their evaluation on how you have handled problems related to this particular task in the past, right? So you, next thing is to link that thing with your research, right? So think about that aspect as well, that if you pick a problem that is very... Uh, uh, like uh, you could say pertinent, very strong problem which needs to be solved for Pakistan. The, it has a linkage with SDGs as well. The next thing uh, that comes in is how to actually link this with your prior research. If, for example, there's a certain aspect of this research that you're not strong with, then have a team member who's strong with this. Build teams on the basis of, you know, uh, who has strengths in which area, right? You're welcome to have uh, PIs and co-PIs. Like PI is, of course, one PI for the project. And uh, the co-PIs from different institutions could be from uh, their respective areas. Like if you're an engineer or if you're a computer scientist, you could have another uh, co-PI from sociology or psychology, for example, or any other area of social sciences for that matter. So, uh, or architecture or business or whatever, or finance, whichever area. So it's comprehensive teams which have, uh, you could say, a broad, uh, you know, like coverage of different fields and how this uh, this team is actually coming together to actually solve a big problem, which is uh, uh, as big enough to be called a challenge, right? Because we write several proposals in RPU, in PDF, and every one of these grants has their own focus proposals. Here, we are talking about the challenge proposals, right? So, LCS yes. and these are the challenge proposals. In challenge, you first identified the problem, related it to the priority areas of HEC, linked it with the SDGs, and then you established that this thing is actually a big enough challenge to work on. Next, you established your own credibility that you know the solution you're going to present, you have background work related to that, you worked related to this problem in the past, and this, uh, the solution you're developing, you have the requisite skill to implement those components which are there in the solution. Then I'd say that you should divide the like, of course, may, maybe give a flow chart of what side of what sort of solution your final goal will be like, right? So uh, when you're going to your final goal, what sort of like system do you think will be in place? Uh, what sort of, what data you will put in input or whatever other kind of input you'll require and what sort of output you'll have. So a, a broad diagram or a broad graphical description, which reviewer can easily quickly grasp, right? So uh, a lot of text is good, okay? You can write uh, uh, like detail about things and you can uh, describe it in more details. You can be more concrete in your explanations, but it's not good from the point of view of understanding that uh, the reviewer, it, number one, he, uh, he or she, the reviewer will not quickly catch which part of it to read from, right? So uh, uh, if you want to really make an impact, uh, draw up a, like a diagram or a proposal in which try to put things in the form of a flowchart or something. That's what I'd say. And then uh, the next thing you can do is that uh, uh, once that flowchart itself is there and you, you've written some descriptions as well, the descriptions are important too. Uh, they are also required in certain detail uh, in the HEC's proposal and you have to be concrete in what you will do. So you have to uh, link that with, for example, the capabilities of the team. That which person in the team or which group in the team is good at what, right? and highlight those capabilities because the more capable your team is, the better team you have there, the more you'll be able to convince the referee, the reviewer, that uh, you'll be able to actually solve the grand challenge or, you, or the local challenge that you are aiming to actually undertake in this proposal. Then once that is done, uh, you have to be careful as already identified and or highlighted by Atavla Saab in the beginning. Uh, you have to uh, be careful about what, uh, yeah, uh, and also uh, by Mazar Saab, actually, he was also speaking on this, that uh, how you will 
achieve specific goals at the landmark points where HEC evaluators are going to check you later on. So to divide the proposal in terms of what is achievable in which you know amount of time. Because the first few things that I was speaking about were good to actually get the proposal. And then, of course, you have to solve that problem accordingly as well. And you have to have a chime time chart. You have to get a time bar or something in which you actually can prepare a plan of the project, which can implement the whole uh, theme that you've thought about with, uh, you know, completion, with uh, comprehensiveness uh, in uh, the, the appropriate segments of time. Like when the, uh, when the proposal and the project comes to the review to evaluate, let's say in the middle of the project, like midterm review or the end term, it, there are specific questions regarding uh, like uh, which part, like uh, for example, have they completed every part of the proposal that they had actually promised in the proposal, like uh, the project that they had promised in the proposal until this point in time? If not, they have a valid reason. Uh, if they have a valid reason, can they do it in the future? Should funding be released? Should it be stopped? Should it be curtailed? So all these things are there at, at that time as well. So it's not that once you got the proposal, then everything is done for. But first of all, you have to, like, uh, the first step is to come up with the right problem. Establish it as a challenge. The second thing is that once you've established it as a challenge, then you come to the second point, and which is, like, uh, establish uh, the capability of your team that you're able to solve this problem. Then, of course, present the solution that you have in mind uh, in whatever uh, level of detail that you can at this point. And uh, it's okay to be a bit abstract about some points, I think, because like uh, uh, as you go through the project, there are certain details that you figure out while you are uh, working on the research problem. But uh, the overall, like uh, you could say, uh, structure of your solution, at least in the form of a flowchart or something, should be there and it should be describable. In, in some level of detail in the proposal document. Then the next thing after that is to divide it in terms of time, that how much you're going to complete in how much time. And, uh, you know, like accordingly with which you will have to keep to later on as well. So uh, it's not a, like a manifesto of a political party that you promise something and, and then, you know, nobody can do anything for the five years that you were, you know, in there in the office. In this case, there are reviewers who review the thing every, you know, one year or something, like every certain time. There are people who look at the proposal and for every midterm review, you have to be prepared that, uh, uh, like, your proposal actually is prepared in the form that you're actually able to solve the things. The third thing is the input from your industrial partners, right? So uh, the partners that you pick who are actually the customers of your solution. So uh, there are two things here which are important. One is from the proposal aspect and the other is, of course, from our own professional aspect as well. The first thing is that you, when you pick industrial partners, it's important to have good chemistry, right? So if you have worked with some industrial partner before, uh, do try that, you know, maybe if they are big enough uh, and they, their name in the proposal would sound convincing, the letter from their side would sound convincing, it will look really good. From the point of view of winning the proposal, if they can actually chip in some amount of money, this is more convincing for the reviewers that it, look, the industry really wants this solution. That's why they put in finances in the solution as well, right? But if they are not able to put in money, at least quantify whatever work they're doing and whatever help they're providing you in terms of some financial equivalence, right? That they are providing you this, this support. And this support is equivalent to, for example, what sort of finances. And accordingly, you can fill it up in your proposal. So that is appreciated by the reviewers and by the evaluation boards many times, in my experience. And secondly, the thing is that uh, uh, if that solution can actually be implemented by the industry as well, like uh, it's not just for writing the proposal, but if they're really interested in this as well, if it can be deployed in the industry, if the prototype can actually be tested, this is also very important because like at the end of the, uh, like you, you'll get a big fund uh, with the local challenge or grand challenge fund. And this is an opportunity of a lifetime to actually make a product and uh, create a success story out of it. Right, so for this reason also it is important. So uh, like uh, these are like the main things I think which are uh, attributed here. Also try to read through every aspect, like uh, the lists are very long, but for example, every line here in the proposal description, the in, in the grant local challenge fund description and in the areas of research, the, in the description of the areas of research, every single line is actually uh, quite uh, important. And for this, like uh, you'll uh, like see that, for example, if, uh, here it talks about, for example, that certain PIs, there will be like there's a aspect of 
like promoting gender diversity as well. So here, uh, here it says that uh, in which place was it? Like the, if some of the uh, proposal will also go to female, significant portion of the PIs will be female as well, right? So uh, even if you are, like, uh, let's say you are a team in which there are not a lot of females, it's I, I'd say it would be good to include partners which are females as well to, as uh, co-PIs in the proposals. And of course, uh, it would be great if uh, female PIs are applying as well. And uh, uh, it's encouraging that uh, the chances will increase if you are uh, like, you know, with that as well. So please go through each aspect of the proposal and like uh, whether you agree with something or not agree with something, this is a totally separate issue. The, the requirements of LCS will not change because of that. So please uh, like shape up your proposal accordingly to create like the right impact on the reviewers and to address the requirements of World Bank and the uh, main funding agencies behind LCCF, LCF as a whole, whatever uh, their targets are. I think that the most important page to look at is this one, the uh, research areas, the priority research areas which HEC has identified. So uh, like from these research areas, you can pick the right areas. You see, for example, the lists are pretty small. For example, from engineering, there's only three areas that they've listed down, right? So the lists are pretty small. And also like in other areas, in political science and information technology, you can look at you know, the respective areas that HEC has already identified as priority areas. Within those areas, identify a problem. Then prove that this problem is actually big enough, impactful enough, and uh, you know, like uh, you could say critical enough for it to be called a challenge, right? So if it is a challenge, then your team to actually, uh, you know, how, to, how the team can actually solve that problem, uh, you know, cultivate it according to that. So this is how I think that you can frame a problem. You can pick up a problem from the HEC priority areas. You could actually identify what are the critical aspects of that problem. And then you could frame it as a local challenge fund problem, right? So a problem worthy of being financed through a local challenge fund, uh, you know, fund award. And uh, based on that, when you're like, uh, for the success of your proposal, the other thing you can do is to, uh, you know, to have a team that has members covering every aspect of that problem, right? So uh, a comprehensive team in which the PI as well as the co-PIs actually cover all the aspects of the problem, which are uh, like, you know, uh, the, if you break down your problem into smaller parts, what a part is being handled by which person, right? Which PI is handling, which team is handling? Is that team equipped enough, capable enough, experienced enough to actually handle that part of the problem? And then the second part and the third part and the fourth part, so accordingly like that. And then have a comprehensive, you could say, uh, 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 idea about the solution, put it down in words and description as well. And I'd say, uh, at least in your uh, proposal, at least once, or uh, if possible, more than once, you can use flow charts, diagrams, and uh, audio visual uh, stuff to actually not in the, uh, you cannot have a screen or a GIF running there or a video running there, but whatever uh, you could say pictures or graphs or uh, other graphical tools you can have to describe your proposals better. I think it's better to put it in the proposal and this increases, uh, you know, the comprehensiveness for uh, the comprehensibility for the reviewer. And of course, for the reviewer, because reviewers are not uh, ordinary, uh, just ordinary researchers or people, they are, they are people with a lot of experience. They have handled problems before, they have taken on projects before, sometimes they're very senior people involved in the review and they review themselves. They uh, like uh, sit for the interview themselves as well, and they put through a thorough question answering sessions by themselves as well as we have experienced in the past. So it is important to cover your uh, like the the problem very holistically to bring in strong industrial partners and to uh, cover the problem with all its aspects. So these are my two bits. I hope this was helpful. And um, if there are any questions, I don't know what the format. Uh, S sub can best describe. R sub can best describe. Uh, what that is and uh, there will be a uh, Q&A session is, uh, um, at the end uh, we have a fourth speaker waiting with us uh, before that uh, Dr. Ataullah Shah sir, uh, do, would you like to yes, add something uh, have your hand raised yes I think the uh, biggest art of the presentation since uh, I'm one of the eldest in the room 58 years now uh, you have to be very careful about the time of presentation and better we use the talk points uh, because that makes a very uh, big time saving. 
uh, instead of uh, having too much information which are already available with the people, we have to be very careful. Uh, I fished about seven projects with my team in last three years. And uh, I'll just share with you one of the LCF we hunted uh, last year uh, for about 21 million. And the idea uh, came from the challenge that we had uh, the pandemic in GB uh, created a lot of problems for the education, teaching and learning. And then we thought to have some digital platforms. We developed the LC, uh, uh, the uh, 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 our own uh, learning management system. And then we also realized that none of the school and college in the entire GB could offer online teaching and learning. Now this became a opportunity for us and I said with my team, uh, Dr. Aftab is the uh, head of the computer science department. And I told them that this idea can be pitched in the local challenge fund. Uh, I gave them idea that how this opportunity can be created. And we uh, decided to use a title of strengthening the quality education through digital transformation in the uh, so I'll just like to share with you a quick uh, review of this. And then uh, uh, I'll then quit because I have another meeting uh, at 7 p.m. and I, I requested. So just to go through this project, you see uh, that what we learned from the review process, the first thing was, I'm not going to detail of the project. Uh, the first thing we learned is that but the HR component was highly irrational. And uh, my team thought that we will be bringing a lot of people uh, to employ, which I initially not supported. Uh, so the second problem was the high cost of equipment. Uh, we did not, uh, so we should rationalize the uh, cost of equipment based on the available resources that how for we can share the available resources with us and how the, uh, the bridging can be made between the available resources and the required. So you cannot expect the project uh, financing to give each and everything, your desk and your laptops and everything. So you have to be very careful about the matching grant, which can the with the institution would contribute to the project. You cannot expect that 100% funding would come from the sponsor. The third lesson we learned was that uh, they asked the question there, how, uh, now the idea of this project was that we thought that we should bring the uh, learning management system in 20 schools and colleges and half of them female and then half of them should be the private sector. So we uh, had a uh, understanding with the uh, GB education department and the Aga Khan education services. And within the partner, we uh, had the NUST uh, uh, School of Electrical uh, uh, Computing uh, School and uh, City University Peshawar. And we also uh, built in some of the uh, artificial intelligence. So I think the, uh, I'll just go uh, quickly uh, to show you the architecture of this, uh, this proposal. And uh, I always say as Vice Chancellor uh, to the young colleagues, uh, Napoleon said that give me educated uh, mothers, I'll give you a civilized and educated nation. I rephrase that, give me a good proposal, I'll give you the funding. So it is not, I think the funding is never the issue. The main issue is to write a, a proposal which can be more attractive for the funding. So what we did that keeping this threat of uh, technological education. Now you can see this is the architecture of this design that what we thought and uh, that we will be connecting the schools and colleges to the learning management system. There will be Android based solutions. There will be training of the faculty. We will develop the digital contents for them. We will train them how they can take the uh, attendance, how can they online evaluate the assignments and things like that. And then uh, how the artificial intelligence component can be added to check the whether uh, the student uh, from his uh, eye recognition and things like that. So I think the, uh, the challenges which we face in our daily life become the opportunities for researcher and you, the young researcher have to be very careful. I'll share this, uh, uh, this LCF proposal uh, with Omar Ghani, who, who, uh, which uh, last time qualified and we got 21 million is funding for this project. Uh, and Umar will uh, share with you uh, the details uh, uh, of this project also, so that the young uh, 
talented researcher can learn from that. Umar, thank you very much. I think I have done my session. Uh, I'm sorry we have another meeting uh, with American uh, University uh, in the evening because in the morning there, and uh, we are meeting at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, we have a couple of ideas on the GV Invest uh, conference we are uh, hosting in October. Thank you, Umar, and uh, welcome. You are again here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for coming today. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you all. So with this, we bring our uh, fourth speaker, Dr. Aftab Ahmed, uh, who's also the uh, force behind the National Academy for Young Scientists. Uh, he's, uh, 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 he's done uh, tremendous work in uh, developing uh, several technologies and received uh, funding for uh, a bunch of proposals. Uh, and Mr. Dr. Aftab Ahmed uh, will share his uh, journey uh, and his experience and his knowledge of uh, how we, we, we can maximize our chances for grant funding for research proposals. Uh, what are the steps? What are the key considerations? What are the attributes of a good proposal? So with that, over to you, Dr. Aftab Ahmed, if you can enlighten our audience today with your knowledge. Thank you. Uh, as uh, can you hear me? Is it yes, audible? Yes, I can hear you. OK, great. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about such a prestigious forum of uh, researchers. I'm really delighted to be uh, part of this uh, great forum. And I'm, I'm really delighted to hear about wonderful talks by Ataullah Shah Saab, Mazhar Iqbal Saab, and Professor Yasser Yaz is always uh, good to listen from him and such a nice advice from him as well. Uh, it was really like enlightening to know about all these things uh, they were discussed before. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the proposals, uh, uh, some of the things that will be, uh, that can be really helpful for you uh, to develop like uh, good proposals. I'm actually, I have mostly submitted the proposals in international funding. And that will be quite helpful for you, uh, like how we can get international funding. And in Pakistan, I, I was mostly the reviewer of most of the projects. So I have reviewed hundreds of projects uh, from different universities and they are from range of fields. So uh, what I have observed uh, by reviewing all those projects, uh, this is I'm, I'm also going to share with you. So first, my own journey is like, uh, the challenges, why we should focus on the challenges. And especially, I will not talk more details because uh, the previous speakers, they have talked in detail about uh, the local challenge fund and the uh, uh, grand challenge fund. So I will not talk in detail. But what, one thing I should talk about why local and grand challenges uh, fund. It's actually, uh, this, this is a tradition in most of the countries, especially in most of the 12 countries. You have heard about the UK Grand Challenge Fund or the Canada Grand Challenge Fund or the European Grand Challenge Fund. So there are so many uh, Grand Challenge uh, funding available that is based on the, like, the big challenge they are going to solve. And there, there, there is also a grant on competitive basis. So this is a tradition in most of the 12 countries. And uh, recently, HEC has launched this kind of program that is very, very important. And, and I think this is need of the time because we have prepared our prof professors to some extent about writing the research articles and writing about the grant proposals because HEC started a series of uh, different grant funding. So they have already a bit experience of uh, submitting the proposals. And now we are going towards the grand local and uh, grand challenges. So they can prepare very well uh, the problems. So what are your experience so far over the years? Uh, I, I actually became part of uh, a World Economic Forum. So you know World Economic Forum is a bigger forum of uh, almost all the countries. So in World Economic Forum, I'm part of uh, the scientist community. And in scientist community, we talk about the grand challenges the world is facing. So whenever there is a meeting, we always discuss about the, and this is actually the experience I'm going to share with you, how we actually, how we frame the question and how we can solve the grand challenges. So in all the meetings of World Economic Forum, yearly we discuss uh, about these kind of problems that the, the world is facing. So in World Economic Forum, we talk about the grand challenges the world is uh, facing. So in that case, what we do, uh, there is actually a, a bunch of researchers. They are not only from a single field. So uh, they are in multiple fields. Like I'm a, I'm a biologist, so there is a chemist, there is a mathematician, there is a computer scientist. So we sit together and we work on key areas, the world, the challenges world is facing. For example, we are uh, facing the problem of environmental issues, the environmental uh, 
pollution and so on. But there are so many other similar issues. Uh, there is a problem of like, just like uh, we are facing the pandem uh, pandemic, so we can have the similar pandemic, how we can deal these kind of pandemics and so on. So they, like we can enlist hundreds of these kind of problems. So what do we do in those uh, problems? Uh, we pick a topic, and then we share our experiences, our big background, and we discuss in detail that how we can solve these problems. So they, this discussion actually continues for many days. So we can actually frame the right question, what we are going to solve, what is the real problem? And then we discuss in detail how we can solve that problem. And I think over the years, like I, I became a member of World Economic Forum since uh, 2011. And since that time, I've been part of so many international forums. And in all those international forums, what we used to do is the similar strategy, just like I have discussed. Like there is a, either there is a single, uh, like if it is a bio vegan, for example, that, that is biosciences. So in bio vegan, we just talk about the bio related problems the world is facing and how we can solve those problems. But in, if we talk about all the other like forums, there's an interdisciplinary team. So in all these forums, what we do, we sit together, uh, we discuss our like ideas, and this is how we mature a problem. And this is actually, uh, this is what I was saying to do. Uh, this is the uh, exercise we lack in Pakistan that we should have in Pakistan that uh, just like there is a, a local challenge or grand challenge. So in each university, they can have a meeting of all the professors. They can sit together and they can talk about their experience. And mostly the faculty is trained abroad. So they have very good experience that how they actually solve the problem. Uh, they can bring their own experiences. And on the same table, we discuss these kind of problems. Uh, and this is how we can mature the problem. So in Pakistan, what they have observed, and I, I'm sure most of you will agree with me, is that we lack uh, the real problem. We, we actually lack the ability to dwell a question about the problem that what actually the problem we are facing and if we will not define our problem then how we can solve our problem so this is exercise that we lack in pakistan and i'm sure with the efforts of our education commission just like they, they are bringing the people they are bringing the experts from all the fields just like professor ayaz is there uh, there are so many experts there and so they actually can share their own experiences and this is how we can actually frame the question and we can better come up with the solutions of those problems. So this is the right time that HEC has launched this uh, local and grand challenge. So we can work on our local problem. Our local problems uh, may be very different than the problem of the rest of the world and the rest of the world might have solved those problems. So we can actually amend their, uh, their solutions and we can make it up to the level of Pakistan. So this is how we can work here in Pakistan and we can solve a problem. I will give you one example here uh, before moving on to like other uh, discussion. And that is like, I, I've been to, uh, I, I'll, I'll share two examples. One is uh, my experience of meeting with the president of MIT. You know, MIT is the leading uh, university in the world. So I had the opportunity through the World Economic Forum. So I had the meeting with the president of uh, MIT. And in that, I, I framed a question to her that how MIT is the leading university in the world, what you actually do different than the rest of the universities. And her, her answer was like, we actually try to solve local and international problems. And this is what MIT do. You see, you can see there are a lot of startups, there are a lot of industries, there are a lot of patents from MIT. And that is only because they are working on the problems the local problems and international problems. Another example I will give, the, the model is very similar of MIT is uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design. I had the opportunity to visit that university and I met with the officials of that university and they are working on the very similar model that MIT is working. And they are also uh, to their students, they are giving them the problem and if they can solve that problem, they give them the degree. So this is how the universities are actually working on the local problems and on the international uh, problem. Just to give you the scale of like what these, these kind of solutions uh, can bring to the country. Uh, same, we can give the example of Singapore. Singapore is a small country, you know, it's a very small country in Asia. Uh, its population is around 5.5 million, very small population. Uh, so if we compare with Pakistan, we are a country of over 220 million population. So we are a huge, a country, huge land, huge natural resources, huge youth. But what we lack, 
is if you compare the statistics of these two countries, like the export of uh, Singapore is over 500 billion and the export of Pakistan is around 25 billion. So like if you have a comparison of these two countries, uh, there is a huge difference of these two countries. And this is only uh, the, the problem is uh, they are actually focusing on the national problems and they are they have solved those problems very well. And they are focusing on the international problem. If you talk about the diagnostics, for example, they are they are bringing the latest solution. If I talk about my own field, for example, I'm working in area of stem cells. So Singapore is a country. I know the technologies they have. Uh, they are the, recently we also have a, a collaboration with Singapore University, uh, National University of Singapore, in which they have developed the solution for cancer treatment. That's wonderful. That that not been done before, and they they are ready to translate that technology. And you can imagine that how much they can earn. Uh, by solving those. So this is how they are solving the problem. And similarly, uh, we have to solve our problem. What I can see, if you like, if you can look from my eyes, I see problems and problems and problems in Pakistan. And this is what you are also experienced as well. So we have a huge problem and these all problems in Pakistan are actually the opportunities. So these are the open opportunities for us to solve these problems. So how we can solve this problem, we have to start from the very first thing that I have discussed is, to frame the question, how we can find the gaps between the things. And if we can find the gaps, we can definitely, I, I'll give you some of the examples as well. So uh, recently the HCC had launched a uh, local selling fund and grand selling fund, they, that's been uh, discussed in detail. So I will not uh, going to talk about these details. I will focus on some of the things at the end. So in local selling fund is local, uh, we have to local social economic issues. We have to focus on those and we have to work on sustainable development goals. They are being launched and we are quite far in sustainable development goals. So we have to work in Pakistan. They are like how we can improve the education in Pakistan, just like Professor Kaula, he was talking that in Pakistan, uh, we are even not equipped enough to teach online. So how we can have a better online version of our teaching so that that's an issue we can solve. In Pakistan, you can imagine about the education, our, uh, you know, 20, more than 20 million children are out of school. How we can bring them? So how big that would be like local socioeconomic issue that if we can bring those more than 20 million children, they are out of school back to education. So this is a huge problem that we, so there are so many issues actually associated with this problem. If we can focus on each problem, uh, like there are so, uh, there are poverty issue, how we can solve the poverty issue. Uh, there is a, so many issue, you know, Imran, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan, he talked in the very first uh, presentation that in Pakistan, there is a lot of stunted uh, growth, there is a lot of uh, like mental retardation only due to the nutrition problems. So how we can solve these nutrition problems, how we can have the better IQ of our students. So these are the issues. There are so many issues. Uh, we can solve those issues. So we have to focus on these are our local socioeconomic issues. And we have to work on the sustainable development goals and uh, you can find a lot of, lot of problems. For example, if we talk about the dairy sector, Pakistan is an agriculture country. Uh, we have a huge problem, huge, huge problem of milk. You are consuming each house in Pakistan is almost consuming milk, but we are not getting the right milk that is leading to so many problems. If you talk about like the food department, they will say more than 90% of our milk have the alpha toxin level more than the WHO standard. So how we can have a better milk in Pakistan, how we can improve the feed, how we can improve uh, like uh, the feeding pattern in Pakistan that they are not consuming the fungi and so on. So there are so many problems listed with just the dairy sector. And after like milk is being harvested, how we can process it in a way that it can reach to the house safely. There is a list of problems uh, that we can solve. And you know, that these are the real challenge. These are the real local challenge. We can work on these. And if we can build a single success story that can lead to so many success stories in Pakistan. I have seen in Pakistan, they love the success stories. If we start, for example, the gas station in Pakistan, Pakistan became the world largest gas station uh, having country in the world. So uh, if we have a just single solution and uh, uh, Dr. Omar Ghani, he has working on so many like solutions, just like the billion uh, honeybee projects and so many other projects. So if we can like have a single success story that can be translated to so many sectors. So this is how we can actually work on the local challenges. And uh, I will not talk about like these, I'm sure these are uh, being shared with you, but there is a lot of 
funding like 65 million is for the local funding that's, that's quite enough money uh, you can have to solve solve the local problem in addition we have the global challenge fund so we have the bigger uh, problems in pakistan uh, they have given the longer duration for you to solve these problems so there are so many areas uh, i'm not going to discuss i can like talk about like the problem in pakistan in food security just like we talk we, we are an agriculture country and there are so many presentations just recently uh, dr tumar gani was also there in a meeting in ministry of foreign affairs and he was also discussing like the agri tech issues in pakistan so we are an agriculture country everybody knows we have the best canal system in the world we are a good land in the world we have the better produce in the world but that is not enough in pakistan pakistan is still importing like we are importing we are an agriculture country we are importing we that can be shame for us we are an agriculture country uh, we can not produce enough sugar in our country we have to import that so these are the challenges how we can improve our produce another challenge is in pakistan that you you like that there are so many people from the agriculture side you know pakistan is the country which is producing more than 90% 94% of fresh water for agriculture is almost like around 6 to 70% in most of the developed countries so we are using such a surplus amount how we can solve this problem and this problem this is a huge water is a global problem so how we can solve this problem uh, that can be like it, 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 we should have a, a good team of working uh, people they can like work on different aspects how we can like this is not there is not a single solution that's why it's a grand challenge we have to engage multi stakeholders they are from different departments they could be agriculture engineering they could be agriculture management they could be from agriculture finance they could be the engineers they could be the agriculture scientists they could be the soil scientists so we have to engage all these people to solve the problem another i, I will just give you an ex- another example so in the whole world i was in a meeting uh, two years ago in malta and in in that meeting a presentation was made on harvesting the water from the air so in pakistan you you know in pakistan we are not getting the the uh, the healthy water for drinking purpose in, especially that the, there is a huge issues in our cities and in our peripheries so how we can solve this problem uh, so what they have done they have developed the technology in which they can harvest the water from the air and in pakistan we have the humidity level that we can harvest the water from the air so we have to solve our local problem they have well their own technology we can have our own technology in pakistan the thing i am going to discuss is not like this is the technology they have well and we have that the thing i am going to talk is for the grand challenge we have to build a grand team if you have to harvest the water from the air you need a people uh, you need multiple people to work on that technology for example you have to build that device so you need the material scientist uh, you need the electrical engineer you need the mechanical engineer uh, you need like the other scientist who can like uh, hydrologist and uh, so many other people so this is how you can build the right team it's very important to have the right team to solve the solve the problem so we have to engage the multi stakeholders and this is how we can solve solve the problem so there are so many areas i am not going to discuss actually in like water management and sustainable sustainability development and economics sociology and philosophy climate change and environment information technology and telecom so these all the areas are there uh, we can like formulate uh, the local problems we can formulate our global challenges and we can solve by having having the right team so i will not discuss uh, these things i will talk uh, briefly about the requirement for ideal project proposal so this is on the basis of my experience after reading um, hundreds of projects so in like you know there are so many actually uh, now there is a quite a trend that you should have the funding uh, you feel prestige being the professor that oh i have funding from pakistan i have funding from uk uh, from like i have the funding from canada so it's always like give you prestige that you have enough funding and people love to work with you like the student oh my professor has a lot of funding so i should work with so the, so every professor is now in the race to get to, to get some funding so how we can do that you know in hcc professor umar and many other people they often talk that we get hundreds and hundreds of proposals and in 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 the first review uh, in the first review process mostly uh, they they just throw <laughs> the thing I, i'm sorry for using the harsh word but they don't select it only because they are not properly framed so this is how we actually 
uh, we should work on well-defined uh, the summary of the project. It should be well elaborated. We should have clear objective of the research. It's very important, and I will discuss, discuss briefly in future uh, presentation as well. So it should be clear objective of research. Mostly uh, in our proposal, we, we lack this clarity. And in addition, we should have complete introduction of the topic that we are going to work. We should have exact calculation of financial requirement. This is actually part uh, we have to re uh, phrase many times. So uh, if it comes to us, then we give the comments, okay, uh, the financial requirements they have given like, uh, they have asked about 10 millions and this can be solved in like in 5 million. So we have to the, the process of coming and going that goes on, like documents are coming to the reviewer. He gives the commands, so she gave the commands and then it go back to the researchers. And so I think this is the area in which the ORIC should work with the university professor. They should, like if they are going to submit the proposal, the ORIC team should, I don't know what is the, like currently, either the ORIC team is well equipped uh, that they can work on the financial requirements or not, but it should be like, they should done it very uh, uh, clearly. Then should be clear methodology that how they are going to work, then complete description of apparatus and material, whatever is required, they should be in complete description. And it's very important to uh, see the timeline of, timeline for the projects. Mostly our researchers, what we have observed, they are very optimistic. So when they start the project, unfortunately it happened with the COVID, there's so many projects they got delayed. Uh, that, was, uh, that was another challenge and this was mainly due to the COVID. But overall, we have seen that uh, they, they give the things very optimistic. You know, the things are not working in Pakistan the way it should work. I can give you an example. For example, when I was working in Punjab University, if I had to order the primers for my uh, like PCR, it, I used to get like in a month's time. I was working in the United States and I can get the primary if I have order in the bottom, I can get in the evening. So the things are quite fast there. The queen things are not that fast in Pakistan. We are like struggling and the things are building with the passage of time. So you can get the things on quicker basis, but still uh, you should consider in mind, like if you have ordered some equipment, it can be delayed because mostly the things are coming from abroad. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, the team building and selection and everything. So we should have, should work properly on the timeline for projects. We should work, uh, we should be very realistic on the conclusion. And as Professor Mazur, he was saying that we should uh, give the proper references for our, our projects. So <laughs> this could be quite interesting for you that we see the problem in a very different way, as you can see in, in this image. So this is uh, uh, looking at the problem from one side, so you can have a very different conclusion in your mind after looking at this picture. I'm sure if you are watching at this picture in most of the online meeting is like, you just uh, sign in and then, then you disappear. So if you are still here, uh, then you can see that uh, this kind of uh, like, this is how we actually see uh, from one side. And other side, if we see at the same image, that could be a different uh, finding. So this is how we should have like, Whatever we are going to describe, we should cover all the aspects of the problem. And this is one of the things that we uh, truly lack in Pakistan that we should dwell. And actually, we can dwell gradually in our country that we, we can actually uh, see the real problem. We mostly, we are very optimistic, uh, giving one type of solution. But when we go on the other side, then it's uh, totally lost. So this is how we can actually work on the problem. This is uh, the thing I'm actually talking most of the time that we should have the clear research question. And this is very important. This is actually start of having a good project proposal. So you have to have a research question. Uh, you can do a lot of reading from that reading. You can develop the idea. You can test the idea by developing some method. And this is how you Seems like we have lost Dr. Aftab. Uh, 
All right. So as we wait for Dr. Aftab to come back, um, in the meantime, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left before the session is over. I want to show you a quick uh, overview of a program that uh, I designed for, for the uh, Prime Minister, uh, which Dr. Aftab also highlighted in his presentation, the Billion Tree Honey Program. Uh, the pilot of this program has been completed and a PC1 has been approved and uh, very soon uh, the national rollout of this program will begin. Uh, so just want to take you through a, a few key features of what helped me in designing uh, this program. And I have designed numerous programs, completed about almost over two dozen national level assignments, which form the basis of almost some of the key initiative this government is pursuing from, uh, <clears throat> from the NIA housing program to Kamyab Jaman to uh, uh, agriculture scaling up program for income and rural employment. Uh, I've also designed the energy for all, water for all initiatives. And uh, perhaps in the coming three days, I'll be sharing uh, more details of what, uh, you know, uh, uh, what were the key attributes I was looking for uh, in that program design. But coming to this program, uh, if you look at the program objectives that I defined for this program before I went into the detail uh, planning, uh, these are very specific program objectives. And if you look at the program objectives of uh, this program, uh, you know, uh, what I wrote down was significantly contribute to more efficient and effective agriculture value chains by supporting private sector actors. Uh, this program actually was de designed for the entire agriculture sector in which I uh, uh, kind of strat stratified the agriculture sector into five different um, you know, areas and apiculture was one of them, livestock was another one of them, horticulture, floriculture, you know, we look at a whole range of other uh, subsectors within agriculture. But if you look at the uh, program objective indicators, indicator P1 uh, basically focuses on production capacity, quality, and sales uh, in agriculture value chain uh, is improved threefold. In the case of agriculture, we wanted to improve that threefold. In the case of other agriculture value chains, it was specifically defined uh, as something, uh, uh, a different number. Uh, indicator P2, employment is increased by 20% along the apiculture value chains during the program. Indicator P3, apiculture chain specific networks are organized to collaborate with billion tree honey and regular meetings arranged to oversee the progress on KPIs. Indicator P4, inter-ministerial national policy dialogue forum to be made effective. And indicator P5, a corporate entity establishes a public private partnership to achieve economies and scale. Um, after defining these objectives, we went into the detailed planning. Um, and this is something I do for almost every program that I've designed. The starting point, uh, you know, has to, uh, you know, one has to know the problem that you're solving and uh, the key bottlenecks uh, that essentially underpin that problem that you're trying to solve. And once you've identified those bottlenecks, then uh, what you need to do is essentially uh, draw out a, a chart where you then, uh, you know, uh, step by step, uh, try to address those problems. So in, in, and then overall in any project, you need to also uh, plan for project management uh, related activities. So project management is critical, right? So you need to coordinate between a lot of different stakeholders. And if you don't plan for it properly in your proposals, then you know, uh, no matter your uh, idea might be great. Your problem definition might be great. Uh, your methodology might be great, but if you don't have a good project management uh, uh, planning done in your proposal, then uh, you know, uh, the reviewer or the person who's reviewing your proposal perhaps will not um, get the comfort or, or the confidence that you have the ability to actually make all of those things happen. Uh, in, in this particular case, so we planned uh, very crisply what the project management activities are, who's responsible for each activity. And along with that, uh, we presented a timeline, we, we call it a Gantt chart. And you know, beyond the Gantt chart, then we also do some working, we call it the level of effort. So for each activity, we, we define in our team, who's going to be doing and how much time will he be spending on that activity on a monthly basis or on a daily basis or on a weekly basis or on, on an on a annual basis, you can then project that. Uh, once you have uh, assigned responsibilities and you've drawn out the time charts and you've also assigned the level of effort to each member of your team who's going to be working on each one of those activities, then it becomes very simple uh, to develop the budget because you have thought about the project implementation to the granular level. And as you go down, uh, you'd see that we, we've thought about, you know, what we need to do uh, to achieve each one of the uh, program objectives, uh, you know, for policy dialogue, networking, capacity building, what are the activities we need to undertake, who's responsible for each activity. For the common value chain issues, these are all cross-cutting themes across the five agriculture subsectors that uh, the plan that I had developed for the Prime Minister. 
So, so beyond the common value chain issues, uh, then we got into the market valuation, uh, which is essentially a common uh, cross-cutting issue that we need to. When we now come down to the apiculture value chain, in the apiculture value chain, if you look at the specificity of objectives in this particular value chain, the problem that we're trying to solve, uh, objective is commercialization of the value added honey and honey uh, by byproducts is improved over the course of this project. Objective indicated 3.1. Uh, what we are focusing on is uh, kilogram price of centrifuge honey, uh, cent centrifuge uh, purified honey has is raised by almost 20% in main harvesting season. It's a very specific program indicator that we are trying to uh, gauge. Uh, indicator 3.2 is talking about organized production of Bax, royal jelly, pollen, etc. at FOB value increased by 20%. Again, a very specific objective, <clears throat> an indicator that we are going to use and if your indicator is vague, then perhaps measuring that indicator to the course of that project becomes also a challenge. Um, and then finally, technical organization and prerequisites to organic certifications are fulfilled. Now, when you come into the results, so after defining the objective and indicators, then we uh, look at the results that we're trying to achieve. And for each result, we've defined an indicator and means of verification of that indicator. So in this particular case, quality of marketable honey is increased is the result and indicator that we're looking at to uh, measure that is the moisture level of marketable honey is lower than 18%. So when you look at the international standards for export readiness for honey, you see that the German standard is the most stringent standard and German, German standards require honey uh, moisture to in honey to be <clears throat> under 18%, they maintain it at 17%. So this is one indicator. So within that indicate, within that result uh, uh, indicator, we now have several activities that we are looking to do. And for each activity, there's a responsible party and then there's a timeline. And, a, uh, and then beyond that, we've also developed some level of efforts and budgets, but it becomes very easy once you've defined the activity, then you can assign the responsibility and within your team, then you can uh, allocate the number of days, which, which is what we call level of effort. And once you have the number of days for each uh, resource that, that is going to be involved and you know the daily rates, or the monthly rates of those resources, then you know calculating the cost for that activity becomes very simple. Simply multiplying the level of effort with the the rate, uh, which is which could be daily or monthly. Uh, anyway, so you keep going down. You'd see that we have all these results, and we all build, for each result we have all these activities. And uh, really, I mean, for every program that I have implemented, designed, and implemented, and uh, uh, the total number of programs are kind of exceeds more than two dozen. My starting point is always to really you know, uh, define and frame the entire problem and the implementation, uh, uh, you know, of that solution. Uh, because once you have this kind of a framework in front of you, then uh, put it, and putting the meat on the skeleton becomes a lot easy. And uh, identifying the gaps where you have the strengths and uh, identifying the resources, the people who you need to actually deliver against each one of the objectives. If you have not thought about the activities you're going to perform to achieve each result, then it becomes very difficult to uh, identify the right team and, and also then plan your methodology and how you're going to implement and, and uh, achieve those outcomes over a period of time. So this is a quick overview that I wanted to give as we progress in the sessions, and especially in the next coming session, we'll uh, do more hand-to-hand -hand sort of sessions with you in defining and framing your problems and designing your programs and uh, and, your, and, and coming up with methodologies that can help you achieve the outcomes, right? So that you expect from that, uh, from this funding. So with that, I think I will pause and I'll see if Dr. Aftab is back. Uh, Dr. Aftab, if you're back, kindly unmute. And if you have any concluding remarks, please share that. If not, then perhaps we have another 10 minutes to take some question and answer sessions. I also see Dr. Moazur Rahman as part of our uh, uh, team, which is uh, uh, you know, attending today, uh, Dr. Moazur Rahman. It would be good to also have uh, your comments. You, you have a lot of experience in uh, putting proposals together and winning funding. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have about 10 minutes. Uh, Ahad, perhaps if you can look at the chat and see if we have any questions uh, uh, that we need to respond to. Uh, you know, Let's go through the question answer session. Now. I'm back, but actually, I think the time is short. So in just 10 minutes, the, my conclusion will be like to, we should focus on the research problem that we should uh, develop in a way uh, that should be proper. And then most of the things were uh, quite uh, discussed in detail by the panel. So I think uh, that that's how we adhere uh, with all those things. 
uh, we can uh, make a good proposals and uh, it, it definitely it should go through a thorough, thorough review and process. And after that, we, we start working. And I'm sure with this effort, uh, there will be uh, many good proposals that will be coming to HEC and that, that the funding will be released and that will actually uh, make an impact. This is how we can improve the socioeconomic status of Pakistan. This is ultimately the things that we are focusing that we have to improve the things. So I think uh, I shouldn't take much time. Uh, we should, there are so many participants here so we can take the questions. So I am sure the other uh, panel people and you are also there. So uh, we can take the question. If someone want to ask from me, I'm, I'm available. Thank you. By the way, just a point of clarification, Dr. Aftab, I'm not a doctor. I'm an industry practitioner who's come into research by just my virtue of being part of an organization that was in social sector development projects. So we had to uh, do a lot, a lot of research as part of those projects. So I've done a lot of research, implemented a lot of projects, but I'm not a doctor. So uh, just Omar, Omar is fine. Anyway, so thank you so much, all the panelists, Dr. Aftab. Uh, Dr. Tha has left already. Uh, Yasser, Dr. Yasser, and uh, Dr. Mazar Iqbal for uh, fantastic presentations and for sharing your uh, knowledge with our audience today. Uh, Pakistan, uh, um, you know, as Dr. Aftar pointed out in his uh, presentation, uh, is a land of opportunity. You know, I, you know, when I went to U.S., I was told that U.S. is the land of opportunity. Uh, when I went there, I spent almost about uh, eight, nine years at working in U.S. and then in London. I realize, you know, West is not uh, the land of opportunity. The land of opportunity is Pakistan. In our country, people education, health, like Dr. Aftab was pointing out. These are all challenges. But the flip side of all of these challenges are opportunities. So there's no problem in Pakistan. If you start a problem, you figure out that there are tons of other problems that you need to solve before you can solve that one problem. So for every problem, there's an opportunity and uh, identifying a problem to solve is not a big problem here in Pakistan. So this is why I call Pakistan the land of opportunity. Now, what do you want to do? What do you have the capability? A bird in hand principle, you shouldn't, I mean, there's so many problems and it's like, you know, a kid going into a candy store and, you know, getting confused, which candy to pick, right? So, but the, the, the basic rule of thumb is that you need to see a bird in hand principle. What do you have in your network? What is it that you can do? What is your capability? and try to focus and limit the scope of the problem that you're trying to solve. Because if you try to delve into too, uh, too many directions, uh, you may lose your scope and focus and ultimately you may not be able to deliver the end result. So, so these are some themes and uh, uh, recommendations also from our panelists in the last session yesterday. And uh, really, I mean, uh, 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 you know, trying to deliver impact, one needs to take a very scientific approach. And if one uh, you know, is not able to convince the reviewer in, in, in your proposal, you have not taken a scientific approach in defining your problem and designing the solution and, and the methodology to, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, achieve the objectives of your, of your, of your proposal, uh, it becomes very challenging. It becomes very difficult for, the for your proposals to be reviewed and to be accepted and the funding to be granted. And that's what we saw in last year's uh, uh, you know, grand challenge and local challenge fund even though we were able to give uh, more funding for local challenge fund, but the success ratio still was quite low. We could not meet the maximum uh, ceiling that was given to us. We could have given about seven, eight more grants easily for local challenge fund. And in grand challenge fund, we could have given easily more, 20 more grants. Uh, and you know, the fact that we were not able to give those grants was, uh, it was an opportunity lost for Pakistan, for you, for, for everyone. So here we have another round and uh, perhaps uh, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity for you to receive these, uh, uh, the, these funds after this year uh, will, uh, will be significantly less because the first two years we had the maximum funding rounds and the grand challenge fund that will finish. But we have some other funds coming uh, in the next two years. Uh, so my recommendation to you is whoever is working on putting their proposals for GCF or LCF, uh, if you are struggling and you've seen the quality of work, in some of the presentations presented by presenters and also uh, some of the work that I had presented myself. If you feel that you are struggling with that quality, please reach out to us. We are here to help you. We are here to help you improve your proposal, to identify your you know, team members in your team, uh, perhaps in your consortia that can strengthen your proposal and increase your chances of winning. But once you have submitted the proposal, then the evaluation process takes over. And then the evaluation process decides whether you meet the criteria, the minimum threshold, and there's nothing anyone can do. Uh, 
Yeah, so you have limited time, uh, and in this time, whatever we can do to help improve your chances for winning the grant, we are here to help. Reach out to us at HEC. Our details are given in the in the in the in the brochures. I'll also share our details here in, in the chat. And uh, now we'll pause and perhaps take some questions. I see I see one hand from Vakas Ashraf. Ji Vakas, please unmute, unmute and ask your question. Thank you. I'm Dr. Vakas Ashraf, working as assistant professor at Cholistan University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences, Bahawalpur. So uh, I. I was just interested uh, to ask about any priority regarding the local challenge fund uh, for the ideas that can generate jobs for the young graduates. That is a big issue in our country that uh, universities are producing graduates, but where is the job for them? Uh, only teaching institutes cannot provide them enough jobs. So is there any priority within the LCF? Uh, for those ideas that can generate jobs for the young graduates? Gee. Um, for LCF, uh, the focus is on addressing a local SDG challenge. And uh, if you look at the SDG challenges, there are quite a few of them, but you need to pick that SDG challenge that's relevant to your local community and to your university and to your area of research. So what is it that you're working on if you're working on animal and veterinary sciences, perhaps you can look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can look at food security. That would be an area for you, yeah? Uh, you know, there could be several offshoots of that problem that you can figure out, uh, but you need to identify and pick one SDG that's relevant to you under local challenge fund and try to solve that problem. Now, coming to jobs, you talked about jobs. Yes, you're right, there are no jobs and the jobs in traditional uh, economy are redu getting reduced day by day and, uh, you know, we need to create more jobs, but the, the role of a university perhaps is to uh, understand the skills required uh, by the job market, by the industry, by the society, and to, uh, to make your research and to make your, your teaching and the skills you're imparting to those students relevant for the industry. But uh, university's role is not to go out and, and create jobs. University's job is to actually uh, meet the job demand that is in this, that is there in the industry. But when you go to the industry and when you ask the industry uh, whether the graduates uh, produced by the universities, uh, they meet their satisfaction requirement, do they have the minimum set of skills required by the industry? And by and large, uh, the response from the industry is no. So perhaps that's an area where, you know, our cast universities can focus more in making their research more relevant. I recently went to about 100 plus universities and what I realized that no university in Pakistan, not even the best university in Pakistan had a formal process to go out and through a structured uh, uh, questionnaire, understand the, the needs of the industry in terms of what skills they're looking for from the graduates, in terms of what kind of research R&D they're looking for from, from the universities, in terms of what kind of technologies do they need. Um, and you know, this is also a lesson to all, all of us here who, who are wishing to apply for GCF and LCF. If you pick a problem that's not locally relevant, you know, you may do the R&D, you may develop the technology, but when you go out for commercialization, you may realize that there's no response from the industry and society because you did not take the effort of actually trying to uh, quantify the needs of the industry and society before you started working on it. I was just here uh, looking at uh, a message in one of the WhatsApp groups and someone's talking about solar panels that uh, billions of rupees have been given to HSC and all of that and whatnot and to HSC to universities, but uh, we are not even able to make our solar panels. But the point is, do we really need to make solar panels? Is it even feasible for Pakistan to make solar panels? Uh, even if we are able to make solar panels, are we, able, are we ever going to be able to compete with the cost uh, of panels that we are getting from China? Uh, if we are not able to produce solar panels, which are not competitive enough, would we be ever able to sell those panels? So, you know, before we start working on research, we need, need to make sure that it's relevant, it's feasible. And so that once you actually have some results from that research, from that technology development process, you're able to commercialize it. If something is not feasible or not demanded by the society, uh, no matter how good you do, research you do, ultimately it'll always be a challenge to commercialize it. Just a few remarks. We have a second question from Dr. Tayyab. Uh, Dr. Tayyab, please lower your hand and unmute and ask your question. Thank you, Omar. Thank you very much uh, for providing an opportunity to uh, put my uh, question on this forum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists, uh, especially Professor uh, 
Ataula Shah Saab, and then Dr. Mazhar Saab, who has very uh, efficiently and very elaborate has elaborated the concept how we can uh, apply in these uh, global challenge and local challenge fund. Uh, that, that was a good guide, and then of course the other people as well. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, I'm not sure about the global challenge fund, but in the local challenge fund, you had uh, put a limit of three proposal from a university. And uh, the guideline is that the universities will decide the best three proposal from that university. So uh, by this, uh, uh, there might be some conflict of interest at the university level because uh, the, when the PI propose, uh, when the PI propose a project uh, to the university authority, every uh, PI uh, may think that his project is uh, very much in line with the, the call for the funding. So deciding at university level won't be a difficult task rather than if you put uh, all yeah. the proposal at HEC level and then you just uh, screen like the like other projects. Gee. So uh, Dr. Tayyab, thank you for raising a very, very important question. And uh, I'm just a consultant who was hired by HEC to help them across several areas. And I continue to do that. The team that was part of the design of the original program, <clears throat> they've done a great job, but you know, these are all experiments. And when you're designing an experiment, you don't know what the results and outcome of that exper experiment or interventions are gonna be. Uh, uh, the, the, the thought process behind putting this restriction uh, on universities was that uh, we wanted at least the first layer of filter and we wanted the universities to take some lead and especially the Oryx that have been established within the universities to uh, perhaps perform that role. Uh, but what we realized, and especially during my visits to universities, what I realized that because of this restriction, what happened was lots of good proposals could not come to LCF because universities and there are lots of bureaucracies and there's a lot of politics also happening within university level. Uh, people who knew uh, those who were deciding which three proposals have to go uh, got a chance. Those who did not know them well or did not have a good relationship could not convince them to put better proposals forward. Uh, we, I, I, I'm very aware of this problem. And you know this restriction created that problem, but it's part of the design. What I can do for you, and if you feel that you have a good proposal and it's not being pushed through your university, and it's a message. It's a message to everyone. Uh, then reach out to me and. Uh, sorry, someone. Uh, so uh, just reach out to me, write to me, and uh, what we can do is we can speak to your, your university and uh, we can figure out what, what can be done with your proposal. Perhaps we can at A to C make an exception if we find uh, a really good proposal that is not making to the university because of uh, some of these issues pointed out. But uh, rules have been uh, defined and we need to uh, perhaps uh, try to follow those rules, try to follow that process. And if for some reason you feel that uh, uh, you know, this rule is uh, uh, holding you back from submitting a proposal that on merit should have been submitted, then please write to us and write to us early on. Don't wait to the last day so that we can do something for you. Okay, thank you very much, Umar. Th th that, you, that's a big relief. That's a big relief. Uh, just one, uh, one more question. Uh, typically, this was mentioned in the LCF. Is there any limit for the GCF or GCF is open? Any uh, we can propose uh, as much as we can from the university? No, this uh, this restriction was on, on both LCF and GCF. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Rehan, uh, we have time to take one last question and I see only one hand left. So Rehan, please uh, lower your hand and... Uh, G. Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, Rehan from IOBM uh, Karachi and Entrepreneurship Department. I also wrote down the question, uh, why don't we look towards the industry for research problems uh, uh, rather than academia? Because it seems that uh, there might be some uh, questions which are uh, not very practical as you pointed out about the solar panel. So uh, why don't we look at them uh, to have practical problems to be solved? Gee, very good question, Rehan. Uh, my, question, my question to you is, yes, why don't you? What happens in the world? I have recently made four instruments as part of my mapping exercise. If you don't have that instrument, please find a, 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 a get it from someone in your uh, university. Every university should have these four instruments. These four instruments, two of them were 
essentially designed to understand how your Oryx were functioning, both from a supply side and from a demand side point of view, and your BICs, business incubation centers. But other than that, I created two instruments uh, uh, for the, uh, the customers of Oryx and BICs. The customers of uh, Oryx and BICs, uh, in the case of BICs, these are startups. In the case of Oryx, it's industry, it's government, whoever uh, is going to consume your research or your innovations or your technologies uh, are your customers, right? So I drafted a, a complete questionnaire for universities and I encourage universities to go on a periodic basis, go to the industry, ask them the questions. What are they working on? What are they not working on? What are their R&D needs? What are their technology needs? What is it that you can do for them? Unless you reach out to them and collect data on a periodic basis and study that data to define your problems, you'll always struggle uh, to, to, to uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, identify research problems which essentially are demanded by your industry and society. So that initiative, industry doesn't have time. Industry is there to make money. They're, they're not going to come after you. You are the one sitting in, in universities to, to do R&D. You have to take the initiative. You have to, and this is part of your research. You have to go and, uh, you know, understand the, so, you, so I've given a questionnaire. Please look at that question. If you don't have it, you can write to me and I can send it to you again. But every university and every researcher should get into this habit of uh, periodically, you know, and you can't go to everyone. So define your, 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 your target audience, who is relevant to you uh, in the industry, who are your customers, uh, perhaps, you know, you, you, your customer could be government or defense sector or multilaterals or many others. So understand who your customers are. Know your customer and as part of know, know your customer, go out with them, collect research, understand their needs. The more you understand them, the more you can do for them and better academic, industry academic linkages you can, you can develop with them. So, you know, I mean, without that, I think there's no R&D to be done. And uh, historically, that has been one of our biggest challenges. Lot of research, but it has not been demand-driven, need-driven. And before we start working on technology, we do not spend time to really understand whether that technology is even technologically feasible or financially feasible uh, to develop in Pakistan. So these are some really, really important questions for all of you who are, who are now uh, involved in this entire R&D and technology development process. Uh, please follow this process. And these are best practices. Right, and uh, I'm sure you have seen these best practices and this sequence of planning in R&D and technology development in many other sessions and presentations uh, that you have been a part of. So with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, for joining today. We have lots of other sessions coming in this week, next week, uh, and we will try to share as much as we can, try to bring in uh, uh, you know, uh, experienced researchers who have been successfully writing proposals, winning grants, and creating products and technologies that have delivered impact. And with, with, with their input and guidance and feedback, perhaps, you know, uh, we can all collectively lift our R&D capacity in Pakistan and transform Pakistan into a knowledge and innovation driven economy. Thank you, everyone, for joining today.